it, it seems like it's like it's advertising this domination like like a borderline abusive a, behavior in a way like a, a an, yeah an abuse based form of raising boys like it because this is it really is like a father son kind of a thing which is that like if you harm young boys they become strong and if they become strong enough they become great like you and if they become great like you then they're capable of enacting violence on the next generation to make them great and the movie ends with him coming back tougher saying fuck you debt to his dad character and showing that through all of this pain that he was put through he became so great that he's now perfect and he can say fuck you but it ultimately was about yeah. them exchanging that smile of yeah the approval. nod yeah the nod but, was like i'm finally big enough to to beat you thank you for making me great it's like yeah what the but fuck kind of lesson is this it's a red flag Welcome everybody to Waving the Red Flag, the number one uh, dating and movie podcast in the universe. It's your boy Eddie. It's Josh. It's Alvin. Joined today by Macabre Storytelling, Mac Macabre Storytelling. How you say it? <laughs> we actually, funny enough, I actually don't know. Um, so <laughs> you know, I don't even know how to say my own name. Um, so technically, the way you pronounce Macabre, it Macabre. is macabre. Yeah. It's, it's that's what macabre. I thought. Of. It's, it's yeah. what's the R for? That's that's the bullshit. When I first started the channel, I was pronouncing it on my channel macabre, macabre, macabre storytelling, macabre, 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 macabre or whatever. Macabre. Someone commented, "It's like you know, it's not pronounced like that, right?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> it's like six months in. I'm like, you fifty, you fifty k subscribers in, yeah, <laughs> saying so, your own yeah. name wrong for months. The only reason I know it was pronounced macabre is because I watched like it was some like PBS special on like Edgar Allan Poe when I was mm, like eight. Yeah. That's an Eddie, and that's yeah. how they described Lost him. And I was like. Oh, yeah. Yes. That motherfucker's macabre. Oh shit. Yeah. McCorn on the cob. Welcome to the to the podcast. Very nice. Um <laughs> what, we, what we got on, on this list here. Um okay, yeah, Mac, do you want do you want to pick between talking about soft boy movies or talking about bromance movies? Let's do soft boy. I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of other men. <laughs> I wanna be what intimidates me. Because I think that's a lot more my wheelhouse. And I've talked occasionally about men's issues. I had history in both like the the pickup artist and the red pill sphere. This was were like, you, were you a pickup artist? Uh, kind of. I mean, I watched a lot of the vids. I used some of the methods. I never went like into that like goofy realm where I was wearing like peacock feather hat hats. Or... Are you ready to know the five attraction switches that exist in every woman ubiquitously? <laughs> Big top hat made yeah, out of it. <laughs> it was never. Luckily, Raven that shit. The issue was is that for a lot of guys, when people would try to give them dating advice, it was just brain dead shit. It was like, like if you have okay. a guy, he's struggling in the dating market. I don't know how to approach women. I don't know how to like, you know, you know, rizz her up or whatever. Yeah. I don't know how to introduce myself or get better. Pe and they would genu genuinely ask people. It's like, okay, so what do I do? And people would just be like, you know, be confident. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. don't be awkward. Just and let her know you, how you feel. <laughs> Bro, I, her, I don't think that's the problem. <laughs> I oh don't God. think her knowledge of how you feel is the issue here <laughs> in any no situation. Be your friend for six months and then just spring it on her that you're in love with her. That will go great. <laughs> Yo, yeah. I've been in love with you all my life. Sure. Play the long game, buddy. <laughs> Play the long game. Play the yeah. long game. <laughs> So you had all these guys who were like, they had no fucking idea what to do. And then come along these pickup artist guys who were so fucking cringy, but they were the only people offering any sort of tangible advice on how to get guys to, you know, talk to women. And, and the truth is, and this is, I think I actually, I didn't really get in trouble for it, but I actually kind of defended pickup in the sense, not like there's a lot of toxic shit in there. And I actually think a lot of the pickup artist rhetoric is like the precursor to a lot of red pill stuff we're seeing now, it's like high value oh, male like, and yeah, and the, like women as like a distinct species that have yeah. like rules like a Pokemon and things like that mm -hmm. is very strange. But for, at least from my perspective, a lot of like pickup art stuff was just basic social skills catered towards socially inept dudes when you really broke it down they were basically telling guys take a shower get decently fit you don't have to have a six pack just start conversations with like 10 women get blown the fuck out and then you realize it's not the end of the world and then eventually you'll just get better and eventually you'll your social calibration will improve your social confidence will improve but then it kind of gets into like the weird like you said eddie women as a species you stop seeing women as individuals and more of like the, the woman standing in front of you is like the obstacle in your way to getting sex. That's kind of where pickup kind of went wrong. And that's kind of where yeah, it got It crazy. seems like it puts up a wall to where you can't, like, like the way they talk about it, it seems like you can't get past the, like, fucking a lot of women stage. 
like it's like it's purpose built to never actually oh. get to the relationship or like emotional intimacy stage. It's just like you're completely right. That was the issue. A lot of guys that I had myself was that a lot of guys thought, hey, I want a girlfriend. So I'm going to go out and like fuck 50 chicks. But then they did that and then they found a girl they liked and then they realized that they had no they had no idea how to maintain I'm back a at zero. Or, it's a good start. That's kind of how because I feel like you can't your, you can't be a girlfriend and boyfriend with somebody that doesn't want to fuck you. Like it gets your foot. You do in the have door. to get there. Yeah, yeah. It gets your dick in the door. That that is true. But yeah, better in your word, instance, yes. did you <laughs> did you did you have to? <laughs> you just said that so casually. Like, yeah, just get your get your dick in the door. Like, I'm gonna keep going yeah. now. Like, I'm gonna. Like, did Fresh you? Fresh Fit's gonna did, adopt that one now. I know, right? <laughs> you Come on, dude. Get your dick in the door. <laughs> High value males get their dick in the door. This is nah, a, that, yeah. this number one alpha male podcast in the world, right here. That um, is true. That is true. I don't know if you knew that, Mac. We are the most alpha male. Alpha males, theta male. Males, Omega, Epsilon, we're pretty much all of those, the whole Greek alphabet of male types. Um, but what I was curious about is you said you did it, problems, but you defended it, got in like low key trouble for defending it. Do you think that there's a, is there some healthy, like, is there some, like, if you're saying that the thing is bad, but you're defending it, is there some alternative that you're imagining that's like the good parts without the bad parts or? Is there some suggestion that you're making there or what? Yeah. So I think, and this is like what's so frustrating with like red pill shit too. Cause I think underneath all the bullshit, all like the resentment towards women and the misogyny and all like the cringy, there are tangible reasons as to why a lot of young men are attracted to this. Or even like Andrew Tate for his like cringy as he was and all the stupid shit he said. But yeah, I think that there is a way that you can give guys tangible dating tips or like skills on how to improve their dating lives without it constantly revolving around this sort of, because no matter where you go to try and find this advice, it always seemed like it's seeped with this resentment towards women, whether it's like, like modern women or like single mothers or it's a just sense of like there's power modern women, modern yeah, women, modern yeah, exactly. females. I yeah, go to like, go to Tokyo. Uh, I said that I said that too. Early. I was being ironic there. I felt like my tone was unclear. Mm. Um, because I feel like though there is this sense. Of, like, I, th- I think what men tend to resent, and I feel like I've even had this feeling of like I'm not in control of how I'm feeling in response to you. Like you're so attractive that it's like it's fucking up my brain. I can't concentrate on what I'm doing. I'm thinking about whether or not you like me, and like, lo, I'm I'm just trying to put together my Lego set. But you're like walking past, and you're amazing. Um, but I think the issue is like when you make that their problem rather than your problem. But I understand where that impulse to be like, fuck, it's really annoying how much power you have over me for existing. And it's not a particularly strong power, but it's something. So I think that that ends up getting like the flames of that get fed and it turns into some just un- an unspoken hatred that they tend to have. And I think, Matt, I think the biggest issue that I have with a lot of the way men in that sphere talk about relationships with women is that it, it, it has such a sense of entitlement, like, mm-hmm. or like around it, like, like, I'm like, why, why doesn't anyone want to fuck me? Like, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it's, it's never self-reflective. Yeah. It's never, it's never looking right. at you. It's never actually, well, wait, why doesn't it? Yeah, fuck why, <laughs> why, why don't they? And I, and I've said it all the time on this. And I think that like, we've gotten into a situation where the playing field has leveled economically, academically, and a lot of men are struggling with having to be likable individuals. And I do think to Eddie's point, and I think Eddie, I love the fact that you always have these conversations constructively. I do think there's a place where we need to kind of fill in gaps on how men try to become like good partners and how we become people that are desirable and likable and and make ourselves worthy of relationships. But I think that that starts in circles like like what we're doing. I don't, and I don't necessarily mean like, you know, sure. like, each man is is their own individual island where they have to do that kind of stuff. But I think that we can be a place in that too. You have but to I have think, a, a community to like, you know, you can't. Yeah, but I but I think that community, yourself, you know, I think that community needs to be male led. I don't think that we should put the onus on okay, yeah, to, yeah, try no, to, to try to make yes. us better partners oh, in the situations mean. that they're in. Like Absolutely. men need to do that. And, it, and, and if it's men in community, I'm <laughs> that's going to be rough. <laughs> so here's how I see it. If women are talking about like what makes a good woman, what makes a what makes a woman womanly or feminine? They're, they're usually talking about sort of internal things like, you know, being a good, you know, helping your friends, a being a good mother, a career. They're usually talking about themselves, their interactions with others. It's more of an internal process. The issue I have with a lot of this red pill stuff is that whether it's fresh and fit, Andrew Tate, they'll preach male self-improvement. It's like, hey, here's how to be a better man. But almost all of it at the at the root of it is 
your worth as a man is dependent on how women perceive you. What makes you a man? It's like, well, if women want to sleep with you. And that's what's so ironic about like, you have all these guys talking about like, you know, women ain't shit, you know, women don't matter, women are hoes, yada, yada, yada. And yet it's so clear that so many of these guys, their entire sense of self-worth is built around what women think of them. Whereas if I'm talking to men, if we're talking about like, how do you become a good man? How do you become a good man or a masculine man? I don't even think I would probably talk about women at all. I would talk more about integrity and honesty. <laughs> mm, and but that got to do with me. For, do you take care of your family? Like, yeah, are you there? Yeah, like, you <laughs> friendships, yeah. All these like alpha males, their entire identity is based around whether or not women like them or whether they want to fuck them or not. If you're putting your self-worth in complete strangers, that's just a recipe for disaster. But it, it, one thing that I'm that I'm that I wonder about is that it seems like male self improvement always turns into some toxic shit. Not not always, but it seems like because even if we remove, because I'm thinking like on this list we've got like Whiplash, and that's a movie that I've loved. I talked about my love for that that movie. I've talked about how like it, it changed my life. My, yeah, yeah. Um, oh wait, did, did you say that was true for you as well, Alvin? Yeah, I gave you my list oh, of like yes, my life changing yeah. movies. Whiplash was one of. I mean, Revolutionary Road and Goodwill Hunting were also on. Those oh movies. yes, but Whiplash is definitely up there. The point that I was getting at just initially is. I think that for for Whiplash, you're looking at it and you're going like, this is a way to, I mean, it's basically what we see in like tons of other male movies, which is impossible white man stuff, which is like, how do you go from being a dork, a nerd, a loser, not, you know, unhappy in your life, which a lot of people who are viewing a movie are like most average folks are not, you know, they're not doing amazingly. They might be doing okay, but they're not doing amazingly. So any movie where you get to watch somebody transform from what you are into something incredible always seems like this huge inspiration. That's why people love um, uh, Fight Club and shit like that, where it's like you're watching this transformation from a put upon person to being incredible. And I think that's mm-hmm. part of the appeal. But the way they the way they portray that transformation is all. It's never like a guy, you know he starts a garden and finds a nice lady and they become and, and it goes into a lot it's always like and then he started murdering motherfuckers and that's how he became you know or he he like even pursuit of happiness is like the probably the healthiest version of that trope and it's just like yeah he was having to sleep in bathrooms to like get through the hellscape of capitalism in order to feed his baby and be like get like a middle management job a middle management like job in his situation was like a six-figure job in like the 80s though but your point still stands yeah sure yeah a lot of people that like interpret that from like fight club or and and another movie on the list same thing with like 500 days of summer like if you get that like oh this was a this was a a nerd that like went through some stuff and now i like sympathize with this guy you probably missed the point of the movie so fight club you you were not supposed to like sympathize Mm -hmm. with with the character but people do in fight club like sometimes yeah, i i, I, I agree know, with yeah. you people people do but most misinterpreted to. film especially with young men it's exactly. unbelievable. i gotta rewatch it's not even because and the thing it's, is it's, it's like, pretty on the nose like i watched fight really club when i was subtle. like fucking 14 and i got it i was like oh i get this um anyway but my thing with whiplash is that i don't i don't see that at all like so i actually um resonated with it from a perspective of like somebody who was willing to give up something that was potentially good for himself in order to get he, past it in order to, yeah like like giving up something that was temporary in order to be like the best version of yourself in like your okay, chosen okay. field and craft was something that resonated with me because i didn't see it as a as a as a nerd to stud transformation i thought he was a nerd all the way through the movie like i don't think he ever became a stud at any point during that movie i think that he was a nerd that said like i'm going to choose my nerd shit to be really good at my nerd shit instead of like this this relationship that I got. And I I I remember I remember thinking about how I should like go harder in like whatever it was I was doing at the time, math or what the fuck ever. You know, and just like See, but that that does sound vaguely a little bit like like I don't think we disagree. Like when I when I yeah. said nerd to stutter or whatever, I wasn't necessarily saying like, you know, it's wanted where he's a dork and then he becomes a serial killer or an, um, an assassin or whatever. <laughs> it's more like he goes from being <laughs> Yeah. disconnected and unconfident in whatever he's doing because because you say he went from nerd to nerd but he went from nerd to like alpha nerd because by the end of it he's like going toe to toe like screaming back at this like what was previously an incredibly intimidating teacher like that dinner scene where all of his like his put upon father and like the jock cousins or whatever are all sitting at that dinner table and previously he was the guy who somebody bumped into him and he said sorry but now he's so in his nerd energy about I'm going to be one of the greatest jazz musicians of all time. People are going to remember my name and they're never going to speak about any of you all. So past now, 
he he was it was about dominance like that's what that whole scene was about but my, but even even that like from a nerd perspective it's like i think about how like a stud would actually handle that perspective and like how he handled it he handled it like a nerd he ha- he handled it like jesse eisenberg in the social network he yeah. handled it like he handled <laughs> it like a nerd like like yeah but like but like a, like an investment banker like a like a football like a d1 football quarterback who becomes like an investment banker is like the the stereotypical like 80 stud kind of person would have like shut them down and fucking like finished his stake and they would have just like sat around in silence and like he handled it in very much like a a D mm. dungeon master like i'm yeah, crying yeah, yeah, yeah. and i'm like yelling at you <laughs> i'm gonna be the greatest well actually guys ever. yeah like he, everything about it was nerdy and I'm, not, I'm saying that as a nerd like i am a nerd i know what nerd looks like when i see it so you know it, it, it just sounds, didn't strike me as that this sounds to me like this like the common trope is this person is actually just standing up for themselves and i think that's what people actually really relate to which is someone who's like you said being put up put upon and then you finally get to a point where you're actually just able to stand up for yourself. Fuck if you're being a nerd or you're just being some alpha shit. It's just like a person that's standing up for themselves. That's what I, I think that's what the appeal is. But I think that the, the problem is that it's like, that's the appeal. That's what it's supposed to be. But the danger is, and that's why, why I, I call them like these toxic soft boy movies. It's like, well, that's just it's it, <laughs> insulting well, in and of itself. Now, that's why I call well, them these toxic bitch ass toxic soft but, uh, movies. Because, the, because, the, like, even the fantasy of what you're talking about, Alvin, is like you've got this guy who, through nerddom, finds confidence and maybe stands up for himself. But in all of these movies, they go beyond that and they become a dominator through whatever their nerdiness is. So, like, they're not too much different from the jock or the stud, as you said. So it's this, it's the same thing as Fight Club. At the end of the movie, he's a piece of shit to his girlfriend. He's terrible to his family members. He cuts off every like everything in his life to do this thing. He becomes verbally abusive. Yes, in a very nerdy way, but it's the same thing, just in a different flavor. So, so and I'm gonna ask Mac this because I think mm. Mac and Pro- I know I know Eddie hasn't seen this movie, but Mac, you're a movie okay. guy. Josh, you're you're <laughs> you're you're a movie art sports guy. Varsity Blues is a better example of what you're talking about. Varsity Blues is what is what you just described. Yeah, that's what you just okay. described. <laughs> I think well, you the, should watch Varsity Blues and you'll be like, okay, now that's what I'm talking about. Well, um, that's, there's this weird... <laughs> that's the thing, I think, with a lot of young men. and this, like, So, for example, I think Social Network is the best... Because I think movies like Fight Club and Whiplash, they're, they're pretty clear, explicit about what they're about. I think Social Network's the best because okay. Social Network is explicitly a movie about Mark, Mark Zuckerberg who he wants to be popular. He wants to be well-liked. And then at the end of the movie, he goes through all this shit. He burns every bridge he had, and he has this billion-dollar business, and you think it's awesome. But the irony is that everyone fucking hates him. And mm-hmm. the whole point of the movie was that you had, like, you had like a, a really... Th- that was the most unrealistic part of the movie for me, is that when he's dating um, Rooney Mara at the in mm-hmm. the opening scene i'm like bro how did you land this chick like what the fuck i, um, I thought she was pretty dorky honestly like that that most yeah, but she was like hot dorky i was still like it, oh, it was Je- jesse eisenberg like he's a much he's much hotter than what mark zuckerberg looks like in real life okay, like he's okay. a relatively I, I attractive say, so, i thought you were gonna say something completely <laughs> oh wait wait, wait what did you think i was gonna say so i thought you were gonna say he's a much hotter person than like like rooney mario was in like that movie i was like i no. think they were about the same like i think nah, like man. she's like maybe nah, a point and a half She's pretty. A point and a half ah. is a lot, man. That's like a, it's like a Richter scale, bro. Like you know what I mean? It's not like it's logarithmic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Like, yes. But like I feel like that's like he's a nerdy like six, and she's like a nerdy seven. Like they're about like I I've seen that couple of trillion times. Like yeah. I've seen so many people. Like that's who True. she would date. True. Yeah. <laughs> well, that goes against the whole Red Pull thing. It's like women date up. It's like, dude, have you seen some of the dudes that like these like hot ass chicks are dating? I also um, think that like I think we're red... underestimating how hot Jesse Eisenberg is. I know it's like it sounds like I'm like riding this dude's dick, but like he's most nerds aren't as handsome bad. as what he is. But let's also be real, man. He was a computer science major at Harvard. Exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, and she was also at Harvard. Like it's like she was at the, BU. That was that was the whole. Oh, that was the whole right, 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 you're right, you're right. Okay. <laughs> she didn't which have is also to, a good so school, he, by the way. She didn't have to study because she, she went to BU. <laughs> BU is a good fucking school Facebook. for our for our international like audience as well. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like she went to fucking DeVry. Um, yeah. Well, so so yeah. So the whole shout point out to DeVry of, too. Sorry, sorry for DeVry. So and Polytech, let's go. And for Snuggle. See, I think Social Network is a good example because it's very explicit in what it's trying to say. That in his, in Mark's attempt to try and be like the guy he wants to be, he ends up becoming like 
he it's like oh on the surface oh man you have billions of dollars but like your best friend fucking hates you the girl mm. who liked you like she fucking hates your guts you have no one really likes you everyone thinks you're a scumbag and that okay. was kind of the irony of the whole movie mm -hmm. and and so like the, the point of the movie is like or at least the message is like hey you don't have to be this like billionaire like master super bro mm. to like have good things in your life but what's really sad is that I think a lot of young guys, and this kind of goes back to like the whole Andrew Tate, you know, vibe of like self improvement. A lot of guys will watch the social network and be like, "Oh yeah, man, he That's had dope. to do all he had to do all that to like reach the heights and be." It's like, "Oh yeah, he what he did to Eduardo was like totally necessary. You have to do that to achieve greatness." And even Whiplash, where it was like. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, man, you have to go through all that hell to in order to be good. To and become a monster. A, That's like think, so much of the Peter like it's like it's all about you gotta become a be and but I, I can't help myself but find it appealing, which is why I think I, I I relate to this problem. Because I look at the social network, I look at whiplash, and I'm like, I un I understand why people are like Wow, this person the same thing that Alvin experienced. Like this guy decided what the fuck he was gonna do and just went through hell and pain to get to it there's something very romantic about that and which is i think the danger it's very i think that's it it's very romantic but the issue is is that and i think i can speak for i'm i'm, I'm 30 myself but even like i'm getting to the point where i think i did kind of have like that drive where that was very attractive when i was a younger man but now i'm starting to realize just how much or just how shallow it is or just how much more important my relationship mm. with my girlfriend and my True. family is. You also have a ton of examples of the guy that like could have did X, Y, Z and like said, fuck it, I'm going to go see about a girl to, to paraphrase the end of Goodwill, honey. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that, that whole movie mm. was, a, that was a love story. It was, and like, Yo. again, I love, I love that movie. Yes. Again, Goodwill yes, hunting. Yes, 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 yes. And I'm, and I'm not joking when I say this and I won't get into it cause it'll get boring as fuck. But like Goodwill hunting literally changed my life. Like it, mm. it, it, it I can like, see that. I cut because you are Goodwill hunting, hunting bro. Like, I cut yeah, Goodwill yeah, hunting yeah. off. I cut yeah. good, Goodwill hunting off, and I changed yeah. the entire trajectory of my life in about six hours. Like I'm not, like mm. I'm not fucking joking. But that's like, what movie, that, that's what good movies do. Yeah. But that whole story was literally him saying like I could have been X Y Z, and I was like, fuck it, I'm finna go chase you know Mini Driver across the He's country or whatever. Or like again. Again, Varsity Blues. Like James Vanderbeek's okay. character was like, uh, you know, I'm getting ready to go to Brown. I'm riding the bench. You know, I'm a quarterback. Like everybody wants me to do this kind of stuff. Like I'm going to traverse this thing, remain myself, get the girl, still go to Brown. You know, it, mm. like I, I think I think we over index on some of the movies. And I, when I say we, I mean like um, the culture that finds that resonance and the romantic like, is a rarity, like a real rarity. Because when what you just it, described, I hadn't really it, realized because I love that movie. But yeah, I love that movie. But Good Will Hunting is one of the only movies where a male character's greatness is is celebrated for being set aside in service of building community and closeness. Because that movie done anywhere else would be about how he eventually became a great mathematician. Great set, but that's well not what said. the movie's about. The movie is about him going like, what am I? It's all about him getting through his trauma, his relationship mm -hmm. with Robin Williams, his relationship, the closeness and love that he has for his friends, and then choosing to let someone get truly close to him, despite the fact that this motherfucker basically has superpowers. Like it's like us watching Spider Man, and at the end of the movie, he goes, "I don't give a fuck about this Spider Man shit. I'm always late for my anniversary. Say, this shit is dumb. Hey, I'm going to choose life." You also just described the Dark Knight Rises too. Boom boom. Yeah, but he comes. But no, but he rises. He did. He did. No, the end of the movie. The end of the oh, movie the was him movie running off. He was Kyle. fifty. He was fifty. He was fucking forty five. Though Batman okay. was old when he started, bro. He started this shit. He started being Batman. But like he his... finished being Batman. He did all the Batman. He could have still been Batman. Batman. <laughs> you never seen Batman Beyond? The motherfucker no, had but... a suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so, Eddie, you put it. You cutting edge tech. <laughs> this was like it was beautifully put. I think that's the issue with a lot of these movies where even if the message is like, you know, doing all this is going to fuck up your life or like striving too hard for this goal is like going to destroy your relationships. At the end of the movie, it still almost kind of frames it as if it was kind of like worth it. You in should a way. do this. Right. Yeah. You should, do, and, you should make this sacrifice. And it's, that's it's the issue. Like. And that's the issue because when I again, going back to like, I, I fucking hate mentioning it, but like the whole Andrew Tate thing people will bring up it's like well andrew tate says that like his dream is to like you know 
have a good woman and like have kids and have a wonderful relationship. But then you Love look at like shit. you look at his shorts and you look at his content. It's Bugattis and mansions and hoes, and that's the issue with and so sex many trafficking and sex trafficking and sex trafficking <laughs> and cam and girls. Abuse, yep. And yep. that's the issue with young guys is they're instead of like and it's so ironic because a lot of these red pill dudes will talk about that with women. It's like you know, women. You don't want to have like a six figure career. You know, it's what's important is having a family and children (laughs) but here but the thing is is what's ironic is i actually think they're they're right for the wrong reason Mm, i think that like that men actually also want this exactly it's like Mm. i or i hate when like jordan peterson talks about that it's like why would any woman want to like work 80 hour weeks and like not see your kids and not yeah why would anyone (laughs) that sounds awful but guys yeah it's like, yeah, they romanticize. Yeah, man, I can't wait to work 100-hour weeks so I can grind and never see my kids and never have a girlfriend and never see yeah. my family. And I'm like, that sounds like the – and again, I think what's really sad is a lot of guys – a lot of guys don't kind of find that out till later in life. And they kind of almost have to play catch-up because they don't have social skills. They've kind of alienated a lot of their friends and families. Um, any you know potential women who they could have had relationships with because oh I'm on that grind, and then they mm. like they make all this money they're in the place they want to be and they realize they're miserable because they don't have anything really a substance. You don't have a life. life. You don't have yeah. anything at all. You have you have achievement. You've you've like rocketed to the maybe though most most won't like most of y'all won't ever become millionaires or billionaires or any of that. But having like a strong community is actually low key a lot more achievable in terms of like how many of us can actually get there. Yes. Um but I wanted to ask you something Alvin like how do you reconcile because just the way you broke down goodwill hunting and whiplash to me they have almost opposite messages and feelings to them because whiplash ends with him getting the approval for having getting the approval from this like dangerous patriarchal character after having sacrificed all of his life in order to be great whereas goodwill hunting goes the opposite direction he has this much softer gentler patriarchal character who gives him permission to be close to another person and to not focus on how incredible of a science or a mathematician he is and goes i gotta go see about a girl how do you reconcile those two life-changing movies when they're like i I think almost opposites yeah so so i also think that for me one i saw those movies in two completely different spaces in my life yeah that's what i'm wondering so i'm like how did it like i didn't like i didn't arc i'm not talking about will hunting didn't change my life when it dropped when i was fucking six or whatever i don't know when good okay. came out i saw that much later. 90s or something yeah but yeah it was it was definitely like mid to late 90s like this was like yeah. early early ben affleck early matt damon um mm-hmm. that was the but, that was the first one that put them on the map crazy per- first project yeah man yeah. straight out the gate o- oscar, oscar for best screenplay um lucky motherfuckers was like 22 <laughs> i know like, yeah fucking <laughs> lucky motherfuckers <laughs> anyway um nah, it sucks to start at the top though no but so the way I the way I looked at Whiplash wasn't that like this was something that like changed the trajectory of his life. I thought that he was just like a person that like worked through a situation and like beat his villain. You know what I mean? Like it was like Ooh, I didn't I didn't see I didn't see this as like that that's how you would interpret it. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't, won, I didn't finally. <laughs> yeah, it like it looked to me like he was like playing a cat and mouse with like J.K. Simmons and like mm. at the end won. Like I didn't see this as something that completely changed the trajectory of his life. I view Goodwill Hunting as somebody making a life-changing decision Mm -hmm. like i view those two movies as i can definitely see them being like 100 percent like you know linked like there's a correlation there but i don't see them as as opposites well because it still seems like um like when you talk about trajectory when i think about whiplash and that last scene that last scene is the end result of how he's chosen to live his life so when when i'm thinking about okay well how do i as a man lead my life it's like do I sacrifice everything to be great or do I sacrifice greatness in order to be connected? And the two movies have different questions. So when I look at Whiplash, it, it was very much like a trajectory decision that he goes, I don't, I don't I'm I don't going to get that. back on stage with this person. Yeah. I, I think for me, it, oh yeah, go ahead, man. Oh, I think to just to, to Alvin's point, I think the difference, and this kind of relates to fight club too. I think the difference as to why Whiplash ending endings, Whiplash's ending works it's because throughout the entire film, he's basically, in order to be, in order to view himself as great, he needs the approval of J.K. Simmons, his teacher. Yeah. In the final scene, it's when he finally says, fuck you, I know I'm great. 
I don't care about your approval. Because remember, it's that scene where he he walks off stage humiliated, but then he walks mm-hmm. back on stage and he like mouths like "fuck you." It's in that moment that he reaches this like and kind of like Fight Club too, where the entire movie, the narrator is like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm trying to be my own, I'm trying to be my own man. But in reality, he's actually playing a part of Tyler Durden. It's all he's still like looking up to like a a daddy figure. Like he's he thinks he's being his own man, but he's still following in the footsteps of this other person. It's only at the very still end. Like what Whiplash was like, though. Well, that's it. But then at the very end of Fight Club, it's when mm. he finally says, "Fuck you, Tyler. I'm gonna go mm. my own way." That's when, and we don't exactly. I think. I think for you, Eddie, I think the difference is with Fight Club, it works because he's like at rock bottom, but he's free. It's like he has nothing left in his life, but now he can start anew as his own man. I think Mm -hmm. the conflict in Whiplash, and I do agree with this to some extent, is that is the movie saying that it was finally him um, sort of usurping J.K. Simmons that led to him being great? Or is the movie saying that it was J.K. Simmons being so hard on him throughout the entire film that is what resulted in him he had to push him in order to make himself that's great. a very good point so i i know i see what you're saying they ask that I in the movie, think, you know yeah i think I that's do. what the what the movie is all about like in fact it seems like those two it's saying both of those two things that it that it's it, it seems like it's like it's advertising this domination like like a borderline abusive behavior in a way like a a, a, yeah an abuse based form of raising boys like it because this is it really is like a father-son kind of a thing which is that like if you harm young boys they become strong and if they become strong enough they become great like you and if they become great like you then they're capable of enacting violence on the next generation to make them great and the movie ends with him coming back tougher saying fuck you to his dad character and showing that through all of this pain that he was put through he became so great that he's now perfect and he can say fuck you but it ultimately was about yeah. them exchanging that smile of yeah the approval. nod yeah the nod but, was like i'm finally big enough to to beat you thank you for making me great it's like yeah what the but fuck kind of lesson think, is this i also think that there are lessons in there that don't even extend past those moments which is why i see like okay. goodwill hunting and whiplash is a different moment so i'm gonna keep making sports movie references anyway so in the replacements right I'll you know there's a, yeah so there it's you know the replacements keanu reeves one of my favorite football movies by the way um overall That's sports like movies sci- like sci-fi period movie. okay. so it's a, a a player strike and they get all of these like washed up you know former pro like washouts you know sometimes like some collegiate mm. players that didn't quite make it and they come on as replacement players and they try to like salvage a season so there's this final game where like you know Keanu Reeves has had these ups and downs as a player. You know, he's he's doubting himself. He's doubting his confidence. He comes back, wins his confidence. They win this final game. They know nothing will ever happen um, after this. Like, the players, like, sign the bargaining mm-hmm. agreement. Everybody comes back. They play a regular fucking postseason. Like, nothing ever happened. And then Gene Hackman does this voiceover speech where he's like, even if nothing ever comes from this, you know, they had a moment of greatness, and greatness sticks with you. So what I view in those situations, like in Whiplash, I don't even necessarily think that anything happened past that point. Like he could have like became like a fucking, you know, accountant after that. But I think that right, from right, my right. perspective, I appreciate the fact that he sacrificed what he needed to do to like beat his demon. And I think that the demon was I think J.K. Simmons, character was more of a metaphor for internal demons that he had to pass to do that. And I don't necessarily think that he had to like be become like the world's greatest jazz musician for that sort of have resonance. I think he could have just beat that individual person, which was a representative of something else. And it can still be like a phenomenal story. And it doesn't have to be an opposition of anything else. Cause sometimes I feel like the need to like win is antithetical to actually being happy. Like the fact that he needed to beat that character instead of just being like, actually, no, I think maybe it'd be nice if I could just form like a nice relationship and be an okay musician and do this. But it's like, no, the the way that I get access to this being a correct ending is that I have to beat this thing. I think, this person. I think it's alleg- I think it's allegorical, man. Which is why I think which is why I mm. think Fight Club does it well, okay. right? Because Fight Club gives you like Fight Club demystifies that aspect of it, right? Where you know that you know that this wasn't a real thing. You know what I mean? Like you know that this was like something else. So I think in his that own it's, head. Yeah. yeah, I think that it's allegorical, and I think that J.K. Simmons was just a personification of that. It's just so funny though how even today Fight Club is still horribly misinterpreted, or how the no- how. The way the film, people still, like, emulate and, you know, 
uh, you know, glorify Tyler Durden as a character when the entire point of the film was that he was a sort of false god, a false idol that the narrator had to see past in order to become his own man. And yet I still see like Sigma male edits of like Tyler Durden, man. I'm like, oh my God, what the fuck? You can't make a character too hot. People will just, there's no, there's if you make a character cool, it doesn't That's, matter how much they were the bad guy. People are going to be like, oh, American Psycho. Oh, shit. Fucking Joe issue. Goldberg. Like, it's just. They see the six pack. They see the mm. fuck God. They see the. It's all they. They're still stuck in, like, the narrator phase. They're still stuck in the. I want to be Tyler mm. Durden. It's like, yeah. no. The entire point of the movie is fuck Tyler Durden. Be your own man. Yeah. But a and lot even, of guys are still stuck in that mode. And even and even medium uh, mediums that. Media, I should say, that go out of their way to show you that this guy that you're mm-hmm. idolizing is a horrible person. So I'm thinking like, so, so my, my best examples are um, uh, Mad Men and um, mm. Rick and Morty. Like yep. in Mad Men oh, and Rick yeah. and Morty, the writers go out of their way to say, you should not idolize this person. This person is horrible. We're doing this for entertainment mm. person. Rick Sanchez is horrible. Don Draper is a horrible person and people are like oh my god i just can't you know Rick Sanchez this guy is so go. fucking cool uh, holy shit with the whiskey and the scotch i think it's don I think draper what the greatest uh i think it's an impossible task because you can't you can't make people hate your protagonist and watch your movie it's not i don't think it's possible to even tell a story that way and, well, and achieve you, what you're what you're trying to well the issue particularly like with Mad Men, that's like a a perfect example because the entire point of Mad Men is that Don Draper well that's the whole you know spoilers for Mad Men it's been out for a while <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, 12 and you years fi- later <laughs> yeah and you find and you find this out in like the you fourth episode say that. you can't just who watches everything that's 12 years sorry go ahead I, come. I know you and, I know you just start watching Fringe I know I get yeah. it I get it I get it <laughs> I, yeah well I started rewatching. I've seen it before but okay, great, I mean great, great. how how it okay I'm not gonna get on that we're gonna go, talk about it afterwards I love that show anyway yeah. go ahead <laughs> so so like you know you because you find this out in like the fourth episode but the entire irony of the show is that Don Draper isn't even his real name, the character. Mm, the, oh so yeah. the entire part, yeah. this yeah. entire persona that he's built of like this like suave, handsome, talking, mm. you know, ad man who gets everything he wants, he fucking hates it because he knows in his in like his heart that it's not really it's him. It's not who he is. Yeah. And the entire point of and it's again, it's like even as the show goes on, he cheats on his wife. He lies to his friends. He holds people to standards, no but doesn't meet. Yeah. yeah, or he holds people to standards, but doesn't meet them himself. So mm. not even on. He isn't even doing a good job of being the masculine archetype that he's trying to be. But all young dudes see is like, "Whoa, man, he fucked he's that chick." Cool <laughs> yeah, he fucked that chick in like episode yeah, five. We or, like bad people. Like we like when people are bad, but they because it's like. Who the fuck is watching Mad Men if this motherfucker is just a very healthy ad, like ad creative? Like that's the boring, that's a dumb show. Nobody wants to watch that. I'm saying so I can watch shows like about villains and and I can watch shows about villains and like be like, okay, that's a villain show. Like I don't like for example, like I no, no, um, no, but the Joker, the Joker. I don't. Scale. Yeah, agreed. But and, big, and big scale, like awesome. I agree, an individual can, but I don't think that you can make a movie where you go, this character is so interesting and so hot, and you're so gonna want to watch them be bad for like two hours every week. They're bad. Well, I don't th- I c- can you think of a time that that's ever been done where the main character was bad and people don't romanticize them heavily? Um, fucking, um, what's the, um, you know what I'm talking about? The Adam Sandler shit. The Adam uh, Sandler click? shit. Oh, Uncut okay. Gems? Yeah, Uncut Gems. Oh, oh yeah, man, okay. that movie. <laughs> that was a good one. But uh, yeah, I think he was a loser the whole movie, though. Like, nobody. Fair. Okay. Fair. Like, the point of the movie was that he was a loser. So he there was never a point where, except he did have a relatively hot girlfriend but even that was unsure whether or not she even like liked him yeah so that was also her lens he was just like a i I think the never mind cut that out (laughs) temporary example was uh, breaking bad Mm -hmm. where at least from my view is a story about a bad man the more i i rewatch breaking bad the more i realize that the character of walter white he was a bastard from the very beginning he was like a bitter angry small man who just wanted to feel strong who just wanted to feel big for once in his life and eventually he just completely destroyed his life his family's life everything around him and that's kind of like why i don't like the ending of breaking bad because i don't think it kind of drives that home um but yeah so the more i watch it i just despise the character i understand him i understand why he's doing what he's doing but he's really a despicable character 
But it's kind of concerning when even today you'll have fans who are still kind of like on Team Walter. Yeah. Who I oh, gotta gosh. rewatch that show because oh, no. I still I hated her <laughs> way too much watching that show. I was like, this bitch don't want her husband to be a murderous drug dealer selling meth. He's First of all, like, I fucking hate Walter White's character. I say this shit all the time. Like, I and I know, and I know, I remember thinking, yeah, I know what you're gonna say, Eddie, to what I'm about to say, but I'm finna inject some realism to this shit. This motherfucker had okay. like, uh, like graduate level education, e- education, e- <laughs> education from yeah. a college that was probably Caltech. People who don't know, like Caltech is like the shit. You go to Caltech and you get any fucking degree, like you're a fucking genius, motherfucker. He had business experience from this gray matter shit. This motherfucker mm. could have done anything other than that, and he's like, we're supposed to feel sorry for him because he elected to be a high school teacher. You could have fucking what? been a, yeah. in a, in a, as a chemistry, you could have been working for fucking Shell or like fucking like Conoco Phillips and making like fucking half a million a year, and like I'm supposed to feel sorry Easily. for you because you because ma- you made a decision. Um, what happened there? I, I, I don't like know. How, how did he the, end up there? Because the, cor- the core that premise of the show doesn't make sense. And the only and the only backstory you get on how he ended up there was the gray matter shit that you got in like bits Times. and pieces. That's a perfect question, Alvin. When you think about it, like this was not a person. He had like a lot of education. He had a lot. He could, I guess he got kicked out of gray matter, but there's no reason he could have couldn't have done fifty other things. Even getting kicked out of gray matter would have helped him get the next yeah, thing. Yeah, like, I was a founding been the member of gray matter. Guy. Yeah, he could have been yeah. the next venture capital like Darling in some other in some other venture. Like I don't get it. And I like think the Winklevoss twins are fine. Like And I think that's when you're when you rewatch the show, that's something that sticks out to you more. Where when when you first watch it, you're like, Oh, this poor guy, you know, he ended up here, he had no choice. Right. But then when you rewatch it, you're like, No, hang on, you gave up. At some point in your life, you became so embittered well, about your situation. That? You had this victim mentality of because mm. even throughout the show, he keeps saying in his head he was like, "I was forced out of gray matter by my partners," but then later in the series, he flat out says, "No, I left," mm-hmm. and that is a hint right there that like, oh, like he threw a tantrum because he didn't was getting what he wanted kind of energy. You have this. He has this victim mentality of he has to sort of like make his life worse these are characters who perpetually keep themselves in like a miserable state oh another character like that is mm. on house from, yes, yes 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 a character who keeps themselves miserable yeah. because they it, they think it makes them special or like it's they they enjoy that victim mentality when in reality mm. they could do whatever they want mm. but and again with yeah and yeah. again with, with house like and with Rick and Morty, I think, and Rick, Rick and Morty's much more. Um, I think Rick and Morty's much better written than House, and I'm saying it as a person who thinks House is a, a B B plus show because yeah. it it, it that massive off. attack song is yeah, is, but it's still so, in my rotation. Right. So Rick and Morty's much better written, so they do it more tactfully. But both of those shows go out of their way to say like, you are not supposed to like this character. This character is horrible. Please don't like this character. And everybody's like, "Oh my God, I wish I could be Doctor House." Yeah. House seemed much House more redeemable so from what I recall. Like he, he did, he did nice, like he did like nice he shit. The- he did nice shit, but it was from a narcissistic yeah. place. It was a yeah. god complex, nice situation. It seemed like they were constantly trying to convince us that, like, and, and they, but they, I don't know if I agree with what you just said because I feel like both Rick and Morty and House, the underlying premise is always like, but secretly, secretly, he's actually nice and good, like. Like that, the character is constantly fighting against. Like somewhere in the back of their head is this like nice person who wants to do kind things for good bro. reasons, but it's constantly pretending to be an asshole. Nah, bro. Let I me, feel like both of those shows have a ton let of me, that. Let me break down my favorite my favorite scene of House. My favorite scene. <laughs> okay. Spoiler okay. alert. Spoiler alert. Let's go. Let me see. If I, I, Dame Earl Jones plays an African dictator. He's ill. He gets shit to Princeton Plains, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Was this the fucking uh, welcome, coming to America house crossover? <laughs> no, no, it was not a coming to America house crossover. It was very, it was very dark because again, he was an African dictator who was like murdering people. Um, it was an extremely dark episode. Yeah, I know that it obviously yeah. wasn't a crossover. I'm just saying he also. All right. Well, yes, I'm, I'm aware of coming to America, but he the, right. he's going he's going through an emergency like surgery, and you find out that Chase like let this motherfucker die. He was like, mm. he's a bad person. I'm gonna let him down the table. And mm-hmm. it, it slowly devolves into this situation where Cameron, like, ign- he talks to Cameron because at this point they're married. Spoiler alert. But anyway, so. Oh, wait, sorry. Who, 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 which two characters are this? Um, the white doctors <laughs> from the original <laughs> cast. Wait, the two boys were married? No, Cameron's no. a chick. Yeah. Cameron's, oh, Cameron? um, 
the she's chick, the one from I mean, like, once upon a time oh the oh yeah yeah okay 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 yeah, she's pretty bad she's good yeah so she she finds out she finds out about it right and you know mm. they talk through it and she's not even mad at him and chase is given another surgery and house comes in and he's like you know your wife doesn't even see you as a man the only person that she sees in her life that's a real man is me and she's like doesn't even blame you for this because she thinks that everything that you do is something that i allow and that i control so she doesn't hate you for killing him she hates me so like he literally has to go back to his wife after house tells him that and say like i killed this man i killed this man house didn't kill him i'm a killer i'm a killer so like how how is somebody that's putting two people through that level of hell and destroying their marriage ever supposed to be like a good person he's not he's a bastard he's horrible and that was phenomenal television like he did this shit over a, over a, a body that they're operating on Bro, so like, here's i think this is the thing with house and this is why i like the because it kind of goes back to what you were talking eddie about whiplash there's there's this sort of idea in a lot of these this media where it's like oh in order to be a genius it ha- you have to sacrifice like Sometimes you have to be a bastard. You have to do bad things. What I really loved about House was that it drove point. It drove home the point that House, you are brilliant. You're smart. You can. You have the potential to help all these people. None of that requires you to be a bastard. You're just. It, it's almost like House convinces himself that like, in order to, in order to have this gift and help people. I have to be, I have to push people away and be mean. But I think the show goes, at least in like the first season, what the show was trying to say was that he doesn't, House, you can be a genius and a nice guy who has relationships. You're pushing these people away just because you're like, you're an asshole. You're just, you're just miserable and you just want other people to be miserable. It's not like a give and take sort of thing. The difference with House is that the kind of, what was so ironic about the the show was that yeah, House kind of frames it as if, well, I need to be an asshole to be a genius. When the, what the show was saying, at least in like the first season, was, no, you're a genius, you're just choosing to be an asshole. And it's ruining your life and you should stop. This, I think the show, if it kind of like... Funny enough, I actually... Because I, I did a video on this a while back. I did a video on the Daniel Craig James Bond. But was, what, what I found saying? was interesting, kind of to your point, Eddie, about you know this sort of character... In order to be this like assassin, in order to be good at his job, he has to be someone who does not trust anyone. He used to be someone who is completely cut off, completely cold, cutthroat, no connections to anyone. However, it, particularly in Casino Royale, what the film also, and, and this is like where the conflict is, what the film also shows us is that if it weren't for the people close to him, whether it's Eva Green or Q or M, if it weren't for these people who he trusts with his life, he would have he would he would be dead. So it's like this weird tension between in order to be good at my job, I need to cut connection completely and be this completely free agent, cutthroat, no emotional attachments. However, on the other hand, if I don't have those emotional attachments, I'm also I'm nothing. So at the end of like Casino Royale, they were pretty sure Mathis was in on it and he mm-hmm. was tortured. And he goes back and gets help from Mathis and then Mathis is like later assassinated. And then he has that point where he's dying and he says, don't leave me. And Daniel Craig holds him like hold, literally holds the guy until he dies. Um, he, he also then throws the body in the trash can and he's like, he wouldn't care because Mathis wouldn't have cared. That character was all about the op. But he very clearly was able to express even in front of other people, like having um intimate relationships on a friend basis like he had friends he had people that everybody knew he cared about his his hang-up was romantic relationships um so i think they put that in a special box and i think that's interesting um now that you mention it to something that you just said before do y'all feel like do y'all feel like men take on board that idea of romance as being something that is that there's honor in it being beyond outside of your reach because because what you just described comes up a lot in movies of like i can't i can't be with you like yeah, I have friends. Yeah, I have missions. Yeah, I have community. But I can't love you because I'm a spy. I'm Batman. Whatever. I'm Spider Man. Is that I think a lot of guys end up romanticizing this idea in their life that like, oh, you know, I'm I'm working towards something great, so I can't be in a relationship. But in reality, a lot of these guys don't have any relationship prospects whatsoever, and 
they aren't actually <laughs> it's i i know that sounds harsh <laughs> the problem I, wasn't your drumming career bro nobody wanted you anyway because i've seen this a lot in like the red pill black pill space where a lot of these guys will say like you know yeah i'm, I'm saving myself for marriage like i'm saving my purity but in all honesty the, it's like the elephant in the room is like like do you really mean that or are you just saying it because you're kind of coping because you don't have any romantic you can't fire me i quit so that's yeah. that's interesting so are you saying that you think that people relate to the, that kind of portrayal of masculinity because it gives them a way to go okay so i already don't get bitches what kind of story can i tell around this that feels like it brings meaning to it oh Basically. i'm actually in the same vein as sherlock holmes and house and spider-man i'm doing something great so there's no space for a female partner in my life Basically, they think they're doing something very selfless and like grand, like they're choosing duty over romance. Like there's some sort of like beautiful suffering in their life when in reality, yeah. they're just kind of depressed. Yeah, man, um, I'm, I'm pushing away all my friends and any romantic interest in my family. So I'm grinding in the gym every day. But it's like, what are you building to? To like what works 80 hours at a job that like makes you miserable? Like what is that? Because again, like in all these movies. Okay, okay, okay. Like if we're if we're talking about Spider Man, this idea of like you're being New York savior, it is something that is at least somewhat admirable. But they're just going to the gym, or they're just, or they're just like working jobs that make them miserable, or they're just like really they so it's have like suffering as a placeholder for meaning, kind of a thing. There is that what you're getting at, or basically no. their life sucks, and instead of trying to fix it, they're trying, they're almost like gaslighting themselves into believing that actually there is a meaning to my life sucking. And there is a meaning to the suffering suffering I'm going through. But in reality, there really isn't. And then like five years later, they realize that they are in the exact same spot that they were, thing that we can all, that's part of life. But it seems like for a lot of guys I see, they're like, they think that they're doing something grand in their life when it's like, dude, you'd probably be happier if you got some friends and you like, you found a nice girl just to kind of settle down with, to be honest. Like there's no reason you can't have friends and go to the gym. Or you can't like work on your side hustle and also like have a girlfriend. I think though that that's actually a lot harder than we re like the instruction manual to get to like hit gains is a lot fuck is actually a lot fucking easier than building like really deep friendships in adulthood. Oh, like between part, those two things, part of it. one is way fucking harder. And there's like no instruction manual. There's tons and tons of TikTok clips on should you do <laughs> barbells or bench press or whatever the fuck. There's <laughs> There's so much TikTok information on. <laughs> that's what there's I'm almost saying. there's no, almost because too much. that's where people go to get shit. Like if you're going, there's a constant stream of information. Where am I going to go? Oh, maybe I could do no. this. Maybe I could try this. It's going to be a stream of sixty second clips. The, the reason I'm laughing at you is because you can find. Oh. I say you can find an equally big TikTok cache of like information trying to solve the the other problem. And I think that a I lot disagree. of what, a lot of what we're talking about is the fact that like. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But, but like, go ahead. But it's, it's, I think it's bad information. I think that like what's proliferated now is people in that like red pill like sphere and their echo chamber. Maybe you're talking about views. dating. I don't see any male targeted information that's about how to be better best buddies with your best buddy. Oh, that's okay. definitely that's, not that's anywhere fair. close to in volume of. Okay, that, that's fair. So when, that, you said, that's when you said intimate relationships, I, I, I immediately went to that. But oh, I, no, so I, thinking back, you didn't say that. No, but you didn't say that. You didn't say that. I'm okay, thinking okay. back now. Like you're because you're, you're. I'm thinking friendships. There's no friendship yeah. content for for really for anyone. Yeah. But even more so for guys, there's some female friendship content, but even that's like few and far between. Yeah. Because unless it's done in like a jokey way, most people are afraid it'll come off as like gay yeah it's it's yeah, really yeah, fucked yeah, absolutely up. It's, i've even seen guys saying like you don't hug your best bros you you know fist bump them. or it's like like and like no. as like shitty like as that is cheeks, you know and it's funny too because you'll see it a lot of like you know bromance and stuff the only way men can sort of express that sort of intimacy is either in like a very joking manner kind of like you know like bromance movies and stuff like that it's almost always played for humor it's never like it's kind of sincere, but it's always laced with a lot of humor. Like it's supposed to be funny. That is a bit ridiculous. This is a bit, you know. Yeah. You know, there's no like sister. There's no like brotherhood of the traveling trousers or whatever. Like we don't have that type of shit. I mean, Unless, I like I'm not. I'm not sharing your pants. But like we yeah. can get like <laughs> brotherhoods of like the traveling rollies or something. Brotherhoods of the yeah, traveling yeah, yeah. hublots. I mean, that was no. kind of gross that they were all wearing the same pants. But yeah. What's ironic though is that so yeah, it's either because again, if it was just like a a movie about like just two guys who were like very close intimate friends most people would think it's like so are they supposed to be gay or something 
the only circumstance where it seems like that is permissible isn't something like a war movie or where, or, or, or like a gangster mm-hmm. film like if it's like the town yes. like we're like they're also sure. killing people it's very <laughs> you it have to be to killing be. people you have to be beating people up even with google like, hunting it was the same thing yeah they were like, beating people up you know, like it was yeah. Yeah, like we're like this bros, we're really close, like, but we fight people. Sticks up like, for these. <laughs> I will say, I do <laughs> think. Where Robin Williams is going, like, the reason he sticks up for these guys is because any of them would take a baseball bat to you. Like, if he just said the word, and it's like, that was meant to be the, oh, that's that's male friendship. Yeah. That's what that was supposed yeah. to give us, yeah. you know? I do think Good Will Hunting, especially towards the end, like, there's that great scene where, you know, Chucky tells Will that, like, look, man, I fucking yes. love you, and I want what's best for you. Like, that was a very touching scene. Yeah. And was, something... Yes. Something you that I be don't here think. When I come in here, you when I come in the next morning, you know that's I want my you dream. To be going, yeah. Yeah. Very genuine, very sincere. But then, like, yeah, if something like the town, like Jeremy Renner and Ben Affleck's character, they're very close friends. They love each other, but it's sort of, it's you never speak it, yeah, or it's sort of like meshed in with like this idea of like honor or sort of like you know blood oath. Like it's still coded the, in this very masculine, hyper yeah, and there's the area. There's the one scene where like where he gets where Ben Affleck's character gets Jeremy Renner's character and they go and beat up the guys who um Oh yeah. We're talking to his love interest and he pulls off his oh, mask know, and he yeah, gives yeah. he gives him that speech he was this is my brother, you know like mm-hmm. you know I he was like you see my mm-hmm. face but I know what you look like. Like so we can do this. Like you can come see me wherever. So like it it was that sort of scene where he kind of described like what he meant to him but again, they had to put it in the context of like they're beating the shit out of people. Yes to even be able to express love mm-hmm. or even that like that language of like my brother like my brother in arms like there's always this like very hyper masculine coding of an intimate relationship because if that's not present people will just perceive it as like homoerotic when it's which is really that's fucked the whole up. culture is yeah it's the really whole culture is built around like because we had a, me and josh had this conversation about like male platonic friendships and shit like that where it's just like oh no no one really has like a proper framework for what it is to for men to have that friendship level like because um on um not a call to men what's it called uh the man enough podcast liz plank said this like so brilliantly she was like we have this concept of the bromance and bromance movies where it's like it's it's a bit funny it's a bit oh my god these two grown men who are like best buddies like isn't that so silly and there's no equivalent female term because we just call that friendship yeah like that's just that's just you being friends that's what you're supposed to do there's no reason to make a new portmanteau word of like this silly little weird you know man child activity that you're doing because you're just friends of course you would do these things of course you would love this person to be close to them you know yeah. But I think that also extends to like how they even do stuff like period for men, right? Like that is like quote unquote been period. feminized. Like why why are men's body washes always like in, in silver and black packaging? You know what I mean? Or oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. or like it has to be a man toothbrush and it's black. <laughs> that shit's so it's got, it's weird. runs on diesel. Oh <laughs> it's a man it's a man your razor. Brillo pad to and it's exfoliate. black and blue and silver. Bro, I go to I went to Sephora. This is like a sanding six months brush. ago. It was like six months ago. I go to Sephora with my girlfriend and I'm going through like the men's cologne. Like I don't usually, I, I, don't, I didn't buy anything. They had a men's cologne. It was shaped like a grenade. In like, it was like a glass <laughs> grenade. I was like, what the fuck? I think I, I made like a post about I love it. That shit, like, <laughs> I can't, I can't use this. I can't use this cologne unless it's shaped like a grenade. So that way people won't know that I'm it has not to a be pussy. camo. You know, it has it's, to be camo. Yeah. Camo really, I'm kind is. of in defense of that shit though. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, because, okay, but hold, hold on. Cause I feel like sometimes we get so, <laughs> no, because sometimes we get so like mad at, me, at male shit for being like gendered in some way that it's i feel like we're almost going the other direction because it's like girl shit is girly too like why can't we have some boy shit that's boyish if it doesn't have some other negative element to it like yeah. what's wrong with boy themed cologne like what? it's hey, for man. boys hey man just put that sh- it's like it's like lotion right like i don't i don't need man lotion i don't need girl right, lotion right. like my fucking palm just, just put it in a base bottle palmers. Yeah. yeah it's beige yeah. with True. a brown top palmers yeah like but what? isn't it nice to, to, to perform? Like, I feel like gender is kind of fun. Like, we, I mean, bo- men aren't supposed to say that, but I feel like everybody knows that. Like, we li- people like doing this shit. I think the difference is, is that when it comes to women, and this is something that we've they've talked about a lot about, like, you know, as to ri- the rise of the red pill and all that shit and why it exists, mm-hmm. is because women are in the space where when it comes to sort of like gender expression, 
they have a lot more freedom. So for example, a woman can wear, hey, I feel like wearing a dress today. I feel like wearing jeans and a t-shirt today. They can wear pants. That's crazy. They can have, they have this, and we never, (laughs) and like two in the, and like obviously. think about it. Up until like, up until like, like 35. He was like, these fucking modern women are wearing pants? (laughs) Fucking no, 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 that but, is wild, I mean, bro. Pants? No, I'm. <laughs> what I mean is, like, you have to think about how crazy of a transition it was from pants being exclusively men's clothing to like no one bats an eye at a woman wearing clothing, but it's still considered like very strange for a guy to wear a miniskirt. Yeah, so I think like, that's like women going oh, from man. not wearing pants to wearing pants is the same move as us wearing miniskirts. Oh my like, god. That's how crazy of a move it was. I think oh, that's god. like the key <laughs> where it's like <laughs> like gender expression and playing with it can be fun. But the issue is that when it comes to a lot of like male gender expression it does come with this sort of like added thing of like, are you doing it because you like it or are you doing it because you don't want to be perceived as being unmanly? Agreed. And I feel like Agreed. this is a pressure that's always There's not freedom to get the beige bottle too. It's put on men all the fucking time of like, Oh my God, I saw this. This. Uh, do you guys know who Roel Tomasi is? Godfather of the red pill? No. Okay, good. Don't, don't look him up. Basically, he's I'm like doing it right now. he's like seen as like the godfather of the red pill. He wrote uh, the Rational Male. It was like one of the first, like the Bible of the red pill, like it, oh, man. All, all that crap. Oh no, I've seen this guy. Okay, yeah, there was a male Olympian. He was like 18 years old. He was a swimmer. Um, he's a kid. He was at the Olympics. He was, um, I think, he won a gold medal. Um, this kid's like 18 years old. He's at the Olympics. He's ripped the shit in between races. He would be in the stands and he was knitting. You know, I think a lot of like women on like Twitter were like, oh, cute. Like, that's so cool. Like that he can, you know, he's, he's this like hyper athlete. He's got like ripped six packs, yeah. but also he doesn't care about knitting. And this Roel Tomasi guy, he like blasted him. It's like, oh, look at what the modern man is that this little pussy is like knitting. Dude, these guys are bullshit. It's, They're just it, making shit up to be mad at. But that's, like, what's so weird of, like, you take this kid who is, like, top tier, one of the top swimmers in the world. He's, at 18 years old, he's made it to the top peak rank. physical athletic peak performance. physical condition. Mm-hmm. Ripped the shit. Any chick in the world would probably fuck this kid. And just because he's knitting, all of a sudden, it just, all that shit goes out the door. And it's just so amazing how stringent. And again, I'm not saying that they, you know, gender norms are not stringent on women as well. But it's it's different though. I think I think everybody understands what you're getting at. It's for it's, men. It's women get to like wear pants. We can't hyper. wear skirts. I, I I think that was a good point that I was making earlier. The, the framing of how you said it at first yeah. is what got me, bro. People <laughs> like they're wearing pants. That's crazy. I can't believe it. It's, yeah. Pants. It is wild. It is wild. The framing considering was crazy, we can't bro. wear none of their shit. They can wear a girl can wear everything that we can wear. There's nothing that's off limits for women to wear. We can't wear really none of the shit without someone being like, oh yeah, you're definitely oh yeah, you're, you're queer. It's like. No, I just thought this. Was, I just thought this looked cute. It's a cool top. I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 not so much that like the gender expression for men isn't. Again, it's fun if that's what you like. If you like this or that, but I think men are awarded. Gold. Yeah, it's like yeah, if you like it, whatever. But I Blast, think men, money. they're we're awarded so much less wiggle room when it comes to that. It's very similar to when we see like a female celebrity lose weight. I think you guys remember like when Adele lost a shit ton of weight. Yeah. Um, a while back. Bring back Fat Adele. Well, it's it's difficult. Wait, sorry, I might have fucked up your point. Go ahead. <laughs> Just go say. <laughs> well, it's difficult because on one hand, it's like, well, if that's what she wants to do with, if that's what she wants to do, that's great. If she wanted to do it to be healthier, that's awesome. Yes. Cool. However, we also recognize. I hope she didn't do it because she felt pressure from the media all constantly talking about her weight. And it's like, mm. it doesn't mean that like I don't think that she should lose weight it doesn't mean that i think that like to your point eddie i don't think that she should gain back the weight out of like protest to say like fuck beauty standards we can't separate it from the cultural context of hey are they doing this because of some sort of auxiliary pressure in the media we want her to do it for her because she wants to not because the tabloids do and it's kind of that's kind of like the tightrope that we i'm talking about with men when it comes to if men want to be masculine that's awesome like you should you should have the freedom to but I don't want men to be that way because they feel pressured to be. Oh, if you but. if you want the grenade cologne, buy the grenade yeah. cologne. If you want, that's to. an exceptional point. Yes. If you as, and look, as a matter of fact, I will say, 
if you're going out here and getting the grenade cologne because you feel like restricted and you must do that, that might it. be waving a little bit of a red flag. That's exactly but it. at the same time, you know what I'm saying? If you see other people doing that to where they, they feel like they can never do anything gender wise without the approval of others. And that's what's motivating them. You might be seeing a red flag. It's been yeah. waving the red flag podcast. It's been Eddie. It's been Alvin. It's been Josh. It's been Mac. Where can people find you? Tell them where they can see your stuff. You know what I'm saying? Tell them about what you do. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm on YouTube, uh, Macabre Storytelling, mostly uh, media analysis, film and TV shows, and occasionally men's issues. Very, very exceptional video essays. Very good shit. Um, if y'all want to see us live at the beginning of every episode and you want to join us on the Discord, you want to get bonus episodes, hop on Patreon. That's where you get the full you know, podcast experience. Um, like and subscribe to this. And uh, we'll see y'all next week. Peace, peace. That's the show.